Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome back to Grand Rounds. Please remember to sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium and also uh, please remember to fill out the program evaluations that you got coming in. And if you could give the CME committee uh, any ideas that you might have in regards to future speakers or future topics, uh, we're always appreciative. Uh, today it's uh, my pleasure to reintroduce Dr. Selden Spencer. Uh, Dr. Spencer is a frequent contributor to Grand Rounds, which we much appreciate. Uh, he is certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology and also is a board certified uh, 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 polysomnographer uh, and a sonologist. And uh, he's here today to update us on Alzheimer's disease. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Spencer. Okay, the hardest part is to get this up and running, and sounds like it's going. Okay, well, good. Thanks for coming today, and uh, I want to uh, tell you that I gave some of this talk two years ago, but it's been, uh, as you probably all know, you can look in the newspaper, you can look in your own journals. There's always new information about cognitive decline and uh, dementia, and so I'm going to try to incorporate that. And fact is, it gets kind of sciencey, and you're kind of looking for something practical. Maybe there won't be a lot practical here, but I'll, I'll highlight what I know that way. And uh, in fact, to get us to that point, I did that twice, I guess. But I'll give you the conclusions. So you got your conclusions here, rather than at the end of the talk, you got them right now, which is that uh, there is a phenomenon of normal memory impairment, and that's that's always a challenge for us when we see patients is saying, um, you know, well, am I slipping beyond what I should be slipping? And so there's frankly now some anatomy underlying that concept, and I'll get to that. But you have to be able, in talking to your patients, to offer them uh, that idea that there is a normal cognitive impairment with aging that is considered normal just as your bones don't work quite the same, your, your brain doesn't work quite the same. And then this is a plea for all of us, once again, to pick some kind of device that you like to document that your patient is having some cognitive impairment and uh, use it annually so we have a record in our, um, in our EPIC system. And finally, exercise is a cure. Uh, that's what I said two years ago. That's the only thing that is still viable as a valid treatment for cognitive impairment. Uh, the brain is just an end organ of the heart. To the extent that the heart and the blood vessels are working well, the uh, issue of Alzheimer's and dementia is mitigated. Okay, so let's roll here. So this is the usual outline. We're going to talk about the basics, about measurements, cell death and immunity. This is where we get a little science-y uh, dietary issues always come up. Connect dome, neural networks. And then I think it's very interesting, the whole concept of subjective cognitive decline, which then bears on what's normal, what's abnormal. And then uh, the concept of cognitive reserve, which is going through some convulsions lately. And the cure, which is, again, exercise. I've said it twice. OK. Now, so what are the old reliable testing? What do we use here primarily? We use the mini mental status test, which is actually under copyright and which we should be giving money to Falstein every time we use, but we don't. So uh, we still use it. My nurses find that to be the most convenient, but uh, it is something that's valid. It's been around for a long time, but there's a lot of variants. I was interested, Dr. Ottoman sent me or sent all of us uh, a link to uh, a outpatient uh, written uh, cognitive assessment called SAGE. Uh, which is produced by Ohio State University and is readily available on the internet. But then we're going to talk about gait speed and olfaction as other means of measuring whether or not your patients are having cognitive impairment. And again, just try to do something annually. So this is a sample of one patient having a mini mental status and also having a, mo a MOCA done. The MOCA having more of a frontal lobe emphasis of trying to do alternate sequencing, going from letters to numbers and doing some visual spatial things, which are quite as dominantly represented in many mental status tests. These are options. Again, just try to do something on an annual basis. 
But this whole thing about gate speed, I think, is fascinating. This has been around since the 90s. And uh, I'm going to emphasize an article from the Mayo Clinic that just came out the last year. But this is not a new concept. Oregon has been doing this for years and years. The speed with which your patient walks predicts cognitive decline, period. Okay, So this is the numbers from their study. 1,400 patients aged 70 to 89, all were normal and followed for 15 months, or every 15 months out to five years. Those with slower gaits at onset predicted the onset of cognitive decline, period. These are the beautiful color slides showing the same. You don't want to be in this low, slow quartile down here. The only thing, one thing is going to happen is you're going to get worse over five years whether we're looking at your language ability, whether we're looking at your visual spatial ability, whether we're looking at your memory, it all gets worse. Now, surprisingly, those who walk fast kind of hold their own, as you can see, this top quartile, and you've got the numbers down there at the bottom. So to put, the, put some meat on it, some practical things, and I haven't leaned on my folks yet, but I'm thinking about it because the fact is, you weigh your patient, and then you take them to the room. Why not, uh, without a lot of attention, just get your stopwatch out and measure how fast they walk 25 feet. Now, this is all measured in meters per second, but the standard is 25 feet. How fast does it take to walk 25 feet? And you can see the number down there, 0 0.85 meters per second. Uh, you got somebody who's in trouble then they're going to do worse. And the timing on this is very interesting. You know, this one is looking at five years. The Oregon people say even 12 years out, you can tell this person is going to have trouble. Now, this begs all kinds of questions. What in the world does walking have to do with your memory? Um, all you can say is that walking is a complex motor cognitive behavior, as is memory. And uh, for some reason, it's pretty predictive. So this begs the question, maybe we should walk fast. So here's Hussein Bolt, who runs very fast. And part of it is because he's got very, very long trunk and legs. But he also turns them over very quickly. And uh, as all the neurologists in the room will note, uh, when you get your patient to walk out in the hallway, uh, and they become conscious about their walking, um, they do things differently sometimes. But uh, can you consciously in this audience focus tomorrow, I'm going to walk fast. Every time I'm walking, I'm going to walk fast. Will that make a difference? Will that prevent my cognitive impairment? Um, and the answer is maybe. There's some evidence in the Parkinson's literature that finger tapping, for instance, as a measure of how speed of how much speed you have um, can enhance your performance in, in motor parameters. So walking fast may be a good idea. Um, I'm going to finish off this with a little story. Uh, this is an 86-year-old just introducing the term of bradyphrenia, which is slow thinking. I'm not talking about slow walking. I'm talking about slow thinking. Here's a person who was 86. She was demented, but she was still doing jigsaw puzzles. She still recognized her family. She fell out of her chair. She dinged her head, and everything went sour, went south from there. She couldn't do it afterward. And this was very precipitous. Now, um, I don't know why. I there was many, many, many case histories that I wanted to share, and I kind of left this one in. But it's just interesting how um, some sudden changes can slow a person down tremendously and walking slowly is part of the story. So here's another diagnostic test, and I apologize, the product placement, I could have used GIF, I suppose, but uh, you can see the reference that uh, you can get a little measuring device in front of the left nostril and move a teaspoon of peanut butter and try to move it up centimeter by centimeter until they recognize it. And those who are dementing will have impairment in that uh, detection of smell. And that's been actually kind of out there, and your patients will tell you that their smell and taste is going down. So if you want another diagnostic test that you can put on the, the board annually, that would be it.
Okay, so back to the stuff that we've talked about before. Just to have our words together, dementia is memory impairment, but then other domains of uh, behavior and cognition that impairs function. So when you use the word dementia, you're also implying this person is impaired functionally, whether it be driving, whether it be uh, doing their checkbook, whatever. There's a functional impairment. Mild cognitive impairment is a more uh, politically correct term to use for the dozens and thousands of people out there that something's not right. But they're still living independently in the community. They're still going to the basketball games and still going to the grocery store, but they aren't quite right, and they're aware of it. And then preclinical are people that have absolutely no complaints, no signs of anything, but there's clear-cut evidence of damage in the brain already. I just threw this slide in because there was in some of our journals saying that the incidence of Alzheimer's disease is actually going down, but it's still looking at a uh, huge volume of people and a huge cost to the United States. Um, so this is what it looks like. Oops, sorry. Got to go back here. Previous. There we are. Uh, you have this nice big brain on the one side here. That would be whatever side it is. Um, and then you see the shrunken one. And I want to emphasize particularly the hippocampal structure. This blown out hole here is very important for memory. It's not evident over here. It's just a little slit. And that's what I look at very carefully when I'm looking at a CT scan on a person. This is a coronal section right through the top of the head. Um, so you want to look at things like the cortical ribbon. You want to look at areas that are opened up and atrophic. But then you also want to look at how much ischemic damage is occurring inside the tissue. Because the vast majority of our patients are having some mixture of vascular and cellular death going on. Those are both different physiologies, we think, but uh, they combine to render people cognitively impaired. And then under the microscope, you get to see the plaque, the legendary amyloid plaque, and the legendary tangle, which is just the aftermath of the axons as they clump together. And now I'm going to spend a little time on this cartoon, which I've shown before. This is the amyloid hypothesis, and it all seems to feel real good. But as you'll see as we go along, there are problems. So we know that this little fragment of the amyloid precursor protein gets cleaved aberrantly, and then it clusters into this plaque, and the plaque kind of gloms onto the cell body, and then it kind of destroys and damages the uh, fibrils within the axon, and the cell dies. That's a great story. may not be true. And uh, some of the problems are, and we'll see as we go along, is that the amyloid itself um, is not always toxic to the cell. Uh, it does not always cluster. So there's a lot of steps that go into it. So you got the cleavage, you got to have a cluster, it's got to do something to the cell. There's a lot of variables in here, and I'll, I'll talk about that as we go along. All right, so, so the question is, why does it accumulate? Does it always cause tau, which is those neurofibrils, uh, Clusterin has come forward in the last year as a key chaperone that allows all that amyloid stuff to stick together. And uh, does it matter where it accumulates? You know, that's a big deal. If you have amyloid clustering away from your default mode network, maybe it doesn't matter. Um, and does amyloid and tau always cause dementia? The answer is no. No. Okay, so we went through this before. We do have biomarkers for amyloid. You can measure it in the spinal fluid. You can measure it with a PET scan image, Pittsburgh marker. And you can also measure how much cell damage has occurred. You can measure it in the spinal fluid. You can measure it by glucose utilization or just looking at the structure of the brain. And so this is the hypothesis that we carry, which is you start collecting all this amyloid stuff and then it starts killing cells, and cells go away, and then you get stupid, right? And it all happens in a fine sequence like that. It doesn't really work perfectly, but that's still probably a viable theory for most people. Um, I just threw this in, and I think I said it to one of the oncologists. I thought this was terribly interesting. So if you really wanted to avoid having Alzheimer's disease, you get cancer. 
Isn't that a great idea? No, there is some evidence, that, and, and it's a very fundamental idea that uh, cells die in Alzheimer's disease, whereas in cancer they grow and they won't stop. They won't die, right? So it's a kind of an interesting yin-yang that uh, cancer reduces your risk of Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's disease reduces your risk of cancer. That's a wonderful world, isn't it? So uh, you go on and there's, there's features within cancer characteristics that um, you can read about there. And I just thought that was interesting. Okay, this is where I probably should spend the whole talk. Where's Dr. Hallberg? We can do a whole talk on the immunology of Alzheimer's disease. Because as I said, you get this cluster of amyloid and I think, you know, my sense of the literature right now is that's not a big problem unless there's a lot of inflammation going on. So there are things like this CD36 is a receptor on the endothelium, which allows the uh, immune patterns to communicate between uh, the blood circulation and the brain. And then there's this gene which is on microglia, which has a very fundamental role in innate immunity. So, and then likewise, the, the cascade of complement naturally increases with aging and seems maybe the real root of the whole thing rather than the cleaving of amyloid. And this is, as part of this whole madness, uh, this is an article that came up on Monday. And so I had to add this to the slide too. So here's this RE1 silencer, which I've never heard of before, but this is out of Harvard, where they talk about uh, when you're a little baby and an infant, uh, this allows your neurons to be neurons, but your astrocytes not to be neurons, and it works great when you're little and then goes away, and mysteriously comes back when you're 60 or 70 years old, and if it doesn't come back in the default mode network, you get Alzheimer's disease. So there's a lot of very interesting things, but the bottom line is, if you can carry away the idea that maybe Alzheimer's disease is an immune disorder, and that this amyloid thing is not the whole story. And the reason I say that is because, and I'll show you shortly, people can have loads of amyloid in their brain and do just fine, right? That's frustrating. That's frustrating. because, And I've got to talk about the diet gag issue, which is, uh, it always comes up, you know, what can help those cells stay alive. And I do want to mention there has been several articles that we know glucose metabolism is messed up in the brain, but it isn't a diabetic issue. So it shows up that even you sitting out here, if your blood glucose is normally running at 115 or 120, on the high end of a normal range fasting, that's bad. And that poses risk for you. So there's subtle things that are going on, and obviously there's been experiments still ongoing, phase three trials of just using insulin intranasally, using Actos as a, a means of preventing dementia, and then we'll talk about fats momentarily. But uh, the old story about B12 and homocysteine is still very viable, and there are drugs out there that you can offer your patients that have some concoction of uh, various elements there. Um, and of course, it won't go away. Copper is important. Aluminum is important. But I try to stay away from all this because if the patient wants to do this, I'm more than supportive. It ain't going to hurt them. I don't think it's going to hurt them. But I'm not sure that it's important. I mean, the problem is the cells are dying, and we've got to get at the, the reason why the cells are dying. So here's a beautiful picture. and does not have the name of the product, so that's, but it has some nice pictures. So here's the healthy brain. That red is all that glucose utilization on the cortex, it's very healthy. Alzheimer's disease, not so good. So the concept is, maybe if we gave them a lot of ketone bodies, they would produce more ATP. And that makes a healthy neuron drinking that glass of milk, right? So anyway, that's another concept. And the dietary issues, as I said again, I don't think is where the money is at. If you want to do it, it gives your patient something to do, that's fine. All right, so now we're going to talk about the connectome which, again, is very important because I think Alzheimer's disease, at the end of the day, is a network disease. It's not just an isolated part of the brain. It is a system. And this is going to get wild and woolly, but I think it's very interesting. And so if you're looking for something practical, just take a break. But this is very interesting here. Um, I really think the default mode network, which is where we spend 50% of our day, 
is in need of uh, a publicist, a public uh, relations firm, because it's really getting bashed in the liter literature badly. Um, this is where we spend our day. This is the mind wandering. This is your self uh, focus. Well, what I'm going to do tomorrow? What I'm going to do tomorrow? You know, how do I feel? Those type of things. It's not so. That's where we spend our days. That's where most of us do, unless you're a meditator, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And it has three nodes that are very important: uh, the precuneus and the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. That's your network, and that's where you spend most of your day all the time. And the idea is, if you're spending all your day there, you're banging those neurons. And there's evidence that if you bang the neuron over and over and over, you produce amyloid. So that's not a good thing, right? So in some respects, we want to get away from the default mode network, even though that's kind of where we idle all the time. Talking about attention deficit disorder, it's because you're in this idling mode. You're just in the default mode network. And you can't focus. You can't bring your attention to well, I'm going to paint a picture or something like that. Or I'm going to write a book or I'm going to read a book. Um, so the decline of the neural networks is associated with cognitive decline, particularly this default mode network, and Alzheimer's disease is a network disease. So back to the whole idea of a connect dome. These are eight pictures of the brain doing different things. So looking at the sagittal section, A is not the same as B. B is not the same as C, C is not the same as B. This is a brain doing different things. Maybe they're reading here, maybe they're playing tennis here, or imagining they're playing tennis, or maybe they're writing. You know, the brain does different things depending on your function, what you're doing. But the problem is, this default mode network is where all the action is, the precuneus to the prefrontal to the hippocampus. And you can see this is where we spend 50% of our time. And you can see the amyloid is loaded into these places in Alzheimer's disease. So the default mode network and healthy aging versus Alzheimer's disease, you see uh, the damage is, again, in those areas. But you see amyloid in normal people. So these are people that don't have any complaint, and they've got amyloid deposited in the default mode network just like anybody else. In fact, 20 to 50 percent of people who are absolutely normal have positive Pittsburgh scans. That is, they have deposition of amyloid throughout the brain. So it begs the questions, are all the plaques the same? And that's where we get back into the whole immune behavior of the plaque. Uh, is that evidence for cognitive reserve? That is, we know that people who have gone further along in their education um, tend to have more buffering ability, if you will, to the ravages of age cognitively. Um, but uh, then it gets even worse because you can have people without any amyloid who are cognitively normal but have evidence of neurodegeneration, right? So the cells are dying even though it's not apparently related to amyloid. That's a very small number, but still it begs the question. Now this is a subject <laughs> I, I think is just fascinating. So this is a study. I'll just kind of run through the study. 539 people over age 70. Have you noted a change in your memory? And yes of them said half. And of that, whatever, 260 plus people, um, 160 of them turned into Alzheimer's disease over the next year. So saying yes to that question at age 70 predicted or increased your risk. And in the, those that said yes and still maintain cognitive function, they were loaded with uh, amyloid. So just your sense that, geez, I'm slipping, is probably correct. Uh, that's something to bear in mind when you're talking to your patient. But I've got an out on that if we get to it. Um, so then, again, we've known for years and years and years, the further you're along you go, if you haven't graduated from high school, you do not have the buffering of... Uh, of um, of uh, education to prevent the ravages of the amyloid. Um, so 30 percent of positive Alzheimer's and CSF are cognitively normal. I mentioned that 20 to 50 percent. But it's interesting if you're taking two language, you're buffered. Again, a sense of, cog of uh, cognitive reserve. So 
what is cognitive reserve? You know, I had this image in my mind that, well, maybe it is just that the neuron has more arborization, you know, and it has more axons going here and there. But this past year, there's been a very, very careful pathologic study saying, nope, that's not the case. So there's some sense that, again, it is how the immune system behaves with this injury that uh, bears on the idea of cognitive reserve. So you're, are we going to say that you get a PhD, you're uh, protected on some immunological basis? I don't know. So it's just kind of a very weird subject, but it's still out there and you hear the word said every once in a while and there's nothing to say to your patients that yeah, you should take that College of Seniors course. You should definitely be playing bridge. You should definitely write that book. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about normal cognitive design, de decline. And I want you to focus on panel A, not B and C, because that's a monkey and that's a mouse. This is a human. All right? And uh, the white circles are a young person, and the dark circles are a, an old person, who is normal, and this is a demented person. So the, the fundamental thing, the one thing that everybody seems to agree on is that one thing that goes worse as you get older is the decay of a memory, the speed with which you lose that memory. So you're given seven numbers. Guess what? You're going to forget those numbers after a little bit. But the speed with which you forget is clearly linked with getting older, all right? So um, other things like vocabulary actually get better as you get older. So not everything clearly gets worse with your thinking as you get older. Um, and this is what I thought was really neat and exciting is that with normal cognitive decline, it is located in the dentate gyrus, not the interrhinal cortex. And this is very important, and I'll say it several times because the dentite gyrus is where normal aging occurs. The interrhinal cortex is where Alzheimer's disease occurs. So this goes bad as you get older, but it doesn't have any amyloid, doesn't have any plaque. This goes bad in a lot of people as they get older, and it's loaded with plaques and tangles. So the whole pathology of Alzheimer's disease is clearly richly represented in the interrhinal cortex, not in the dentate gyrus. Now, in mice, you can fix it. You can fix the normal aging, and it's very bizarre, retinoblastoma genes and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it creates this beautiful blue heuristic uh, idea. I just focus on the left three, which is normal aging goes bad in the dentate gyrus. The interrhinal cortex goes bad in Alzheimer's disease, vascular disease. I don't know why they said this, but you know, I think it's not that specific. Again, just to show the distinction. <laughs> So, we've come to the part of the talk where we're going to talk about treatment. And we've already talked about the idea that amyloid's bad, we're going to get rid of bad amyloid. Well, as you well know, or I think Larry was pointing out to me, there was two trials where you have antibodies that suck the amyloid out of the brain, all right? You give the person the antibody, and yes, you can document the amyloid gets out of the brain. They don't get better. They didn't work. Now, we're not done with that concept of sucking amyloid out of the brain and the person getting better because there are people that are clearly genetic and uh, we know they're going to dement by, be demented by, whoops, sorry about that, go back one. You go back, you treat them at age 20 because you know they're going to be demented at age 40 and this trial is ongoing and so maybe it, there's still potential of making that go. Another idea is to try and keep the neurons alive and that's where we talked about the triglycerides, about glucose control, about insulin, actose, all those things, um, B vitamins, stuff like that. Um, and then you try to compensate, and this is what most of us do clinically. We have somebody who's dementing, we try to give them acetylcholine to try and enhance the performance of the remaining cells. That's what denepazil and memantine does in another way through glutamate. Not great, but I'm a believer. There's clear-cut studies that show that these drugs will keep a person in their own home maybe six months longer. That's a huge cost saving from a nursing home perspective. All right. Now you build your cognitive reserve, and how do you do that? We'll talk about that. Maybe you should remodel and relieve your um, connectome. 
basically building your reserve. I'm going to talk about exercise and vascular health, but reading and games all fit in that same category. This is just fascinating, though. Okay, so here's a person meditating, a guy all wired up uh, looking at this stuff. Um, I don't want you to look in it. It's too long, so I think it's a little tedious. Let's go backwards here. Um, so, what if you do functional MRI imaging on people that meditate every day, their default mode network is different than you and me. I don't meditate every day. Their default mode network is a little bit more diffuse and has more connections to different places. So if you take the argument that you're banging and banging and banging away at that default mode network, but if you're a meditator, you are spreading out that uh, repetitive damage, uh, you're going to do better. And the interesting thing is you're not stuck with your default mode network. You can take a naive person, teach them how to meditate, and their default mode network changes. I thought that was kind of interesting. So one idea is you can fiddle around with your default mode network if you believe that whole concept and uh, get into meditation. All right, but the real cure is exercise. And I, I talked to Dr. Hallberg just a little while ago. I thought that uh, the most important thing we can do as a grand rounds here and maybe as a clinic is that we have a vital sign for fitness. Because fitness is, the tr whether it be gait speed or whatever else we're looking at, a person's fitness is the best predictor of what's going to happen down the line. And we don't. I mean, uh, I, there are proxies, and you can talk about uh, uh, pulse pressure. Uh, you can talk about blood pressure variability. All these vascular markers are proxies for fitness. But we know that if you are fit, in midlife, your risk is way down. We know that your slide from mild cognitive impairment into frank dementia and Alzheimer's disease is slowed by fitness. Uh, you have to consider that vascular dementia is a huge part of uh, dementia to begin with. But blood pressure variability, carotid stiffness, amount of microvascular white matter change in the brain, all these vascular markers are key to how badly you do uh, cognitively. Um, your max, you know, there are ways of measuring it. That's your extraction of oxygen, um, getting up to 80% of a maximal heart rate predicted. I think this is a subject that we need to seriously think about and seriously try to incorporate in the care of our patients. And I, I don't have the answer, and I think that's something that we should work on as a vital sign. So I tell my patients, and I believe it, and I think everything in the literature supports this, that the only thing that truly makes a difference, and I write it in capital letters, is exercise. And you know, everybody's going to say, oh, but I walk up and down the stairs. You know, oh, but I go downstairs and I do the laundry. No, you got to huff and puff. Where's Jay Brown? He said that to me over and over again, right? That's the only thing. And so as a proxy, you can tell your patient, if you do not feel warm on your forehead, you're not getting any blood to your brain, okay? So huff and puff gets blood to your brain. That's a practical little take-home thing, right? That's a good thing. All right. So they have to find a way. And um, now I'm going to move on to something that is, but nobody wants to exercise. They want to take a pill, right? So here's your pill. This will cure your Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's interesting. It is, again, tied in with retinoblastomas and retinoid. And it works great in mice with uh, Alzheimer's pathology. And there's your clinical trial at the Cleveland Clinic if you have patients that are really dying to do something with a pill. And yes, indeed, busy minds help. Uh, 294 autopsy brains studied with known premorbid levels of activity. And it slowed cognitive decline. So there you're, you know, God bless the ladies that are out playing bridge and uh, doing their jigsaw puzzles. That's all positive, all good. But as the manager of the sleep or the whatever, the supervisor of the sleep lab, I'm very interested in sleep. And this is um, real interesting because there is sort of a biological uh, underpinning to this. Bear with me. So you got all this junk in your brain, amyloid, right? You want to get that junk out of the brain. How do you get it out of the brain? Well, it's got to go into the spinal fluid. 
It's got to go from the interstitial space into the spinal fluid space. And it turns out that when you sleep, that junction between the interstitial fluid space and the spinal fluid space becomes a little bit more fluid and stuff moves from the interstitial space into the CSF. So sleep is good. However, they have to have good sleep. And that's where the whole problem of obstructive sleep apnea, where the whole problem of fragmented sleep, of uh, insufficient sleep comes in. And, and so trying to attend to that and be wary of that is worth your while. There's some other ideas listed there. Okay, so here's the summary. Many theories, immune, metabolic toxins. I didn't talk about, there's a lot of articles about pesticides, but a lot of theories about what goes on and there are many targets, you know, the connectome, the actual neurons, the white matter, the blood vessels. Talked about those two items. But the treatments, if you do nothing else for your patients and they look hopeless at you, like, what do you mean, my husband's uh, losing it? Tell them you got to get them out. What uh, Dr. Hallberg was saying, and there's a study to this effect, probably the best treatment for Alzheimer's disease is a dog because you got to walk the dog. you got to walk the dog twice or three times a day. That's, and, and it works better than having a buddy, because the buddy will say, oh, it's raining out, I'm not going out, right? <laughs> so you gotta huff and puff, and uh, all the playing of games is very valuable. Um, the medicines, we kind of brushed over real quickly, but I'm not gonna obsess on it, because I'm not sure that that is the end of the world. Try them if you think they're helpful. Okay, well, I think I, uh, stick me with a fork, I think I'm done, all right? <laughs> The floor is open to questions. Yeah. Hi. Hi. The, uh, there's some use currently of IVIG for treatment of Alzheimer's. Yeah. Have you yeah. heard um, about that? I was, very, I was very excited about that, and it, and it uh, burned up in flames over the summer. The phase three trial did not hold up. So I don't think you're done with IVIG, and it does speak to the whole immune inflammatory mechanism that we are concerned about. But the phase one and phase two trials looked very robust and I was sitting there, oh my God, how much is this going to cost? Us? <coughs> and then phase three blew up this summer. It didn't pan out. So I don't know where that's going, but it's dead in the water right now. Yeah. Oh, um, uh, great talk, Sultan. Uh, I, uh, I wanted to just parenthe over here, yeah. parenthetically throw in that uh, uh, I ask my patients if they're exercising before I launch into my diatribe, and then when they say yes, I ask them what they're doing, and a lot of times they look down at their shoes and yeah. tell me about the laundry and what have you. So I right. just propose that as a follow-up question and then emphasize the sweaty out-of-breath stuff. I think I'll, I'll remind them that the enemy of uh, the good so often is the perfect. We all know an hour a day is what the President's Council says. Nobody has time for that. And a lot of us are left to think, well, if I can't do an hour a day, what's the point? And I think there's a nonlinear relationship between how much you do and how much good it probably does. Yeah, uh, I made that up, but I'd lay odds I'm right. Well, it's probably very idiosyncratic, too. You know? Yeah, it probably is. But anyway, my question is, uh, as far as uh, uh, I've had an ongoing debate with Lori. Um, we both play games on our cell phone. And uh, I play Tetris and I play chess. And I like to think of myself as working my brain better than her uh, silly solitaire game where she does the same thing huh. every time. You know what I'm saying? Is there yeah. much science? I mean, there's this luminosity thing. These yeah. people, uh, boy, they sure are hitting us with their ads. Do you have any thoughts as to, like, what kind of games – like, poker's got to be better than bridge, right? It just seems like so much more fun. Thoughts on that? Um, no, I have opinion, but no, no, no data. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, there's so many uh, concerns. I mean, you could run the kind of study, and we could pro I could probably kind of try and research that kind of study. It's a reasonable question, you know, is the more complex the game, is that better for your brain? I would tell you that focusing and having your attention and not sitting in the default mode network is what that's all about, you know? And so that's my speculation, at least. All right, hit it. You, you mentioned about uh, inflammation. Inflammation yeah. causes problems in lots of places. What, about, what studies or what, what um, 
Uh, how has inflammation been addressed in any ongoing studies? Well, you know, um, there was early on, actually, gosh, this goes back almost to residency, that they had a study about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs on a regular basis that initially showed, again, kind of a phase two level that, man, this is promising, this is helping. And then as uh, you, you were saying, talking about IVIG as a, a means of modifying the immune system, wow, this really looks great. But then they don't seem to pan out. They just don't hold up. And, and then maybe, again, that the damage is done. You know, if you don't get at it earlier, the, the joint is already eroded or the, the cell is already dead and, and you're not getting it back. Is that sort of, I just don't see it going anywhere. Yeah. I saw an article about the surgical management of Alzheimer's oh, with yeah. a omental transplant to the surface of the brain. Yeah. Is there anything to that? Um, I'm sorry, I left all that stuff out. You know, we we're spending fortunes now putting deep brain stimulators in the brain to pound the uh, hippocampus to make it work a little bit better. There has been clinical trials. Uh, as I said, you got to clear the stuff from the interstitial space into the spinal fluid so you can put shunts into these people and show that, golly, they do a little bit better. I guess I'm not familiar with the uh, mental thing, but I wouldn't surprise me that that would be another mechanism of trying to pull uh, interstitial junk into the CSF somehow or another. But the answer is none of those, I don't have the articles in front of me and I'm not really confident that they do anything magical at this point. They're not really for, for front. You know, at least I haven't read about it in the Journal of uh, Des Moines Register or the uh, Annals of uh, Associated Press yet. Have, have there been any, any studies on uh, a relationship of systemic amyloidosis to the deposition of the amyloid plaques? No, but the, there is relationship between um, amyloidosis, uh, vascular amyloidosis, and uh, brain amyloidosis. Um, there is a close connection, and that's a big Dutch trial that was looked at where they have strokes and they have a lot of uh, vascular de deposition of amyloid in the endothelial wall, and uh, those people dement very badly, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of grist to that whole concept. That's um, a lot of interest in that whole connection there. But as far as in the liver or elsewhere in the body, no, or the nerve, no. Yeah. Okay, well, that sounds good. Oh, I'm sorry. Linda, you got something? Last but not least, right? Thank you for that great talk, and thanks for throwing in some eye things. Uh, one question I have is, you know, many decades ago, zinc became like the magic pill for macular degeneration, and then everybody was afraid of that because it was found in the neurofibrillary tangles of Alzheimer's disease. Do you have uh -huh. any comments on that? I know you weren't big into diet, but just your two cents on that. Uh, I don't have anything at all. But at least in the last year, there wasn't anything about zinc that I'm aware of. But again, every other metal known to man seems to show up. So, you know, copper was the big player and aluminum, again, the big player this year as far as uh, having a met metal role. I think those are all epiphenomenon, Linda, honest to God. It just, again, that begs the question back to, is the inflammatory thing really the early thing and the amyloid is just all epiphenomenon or is the amyloid the first thing and then you get all this metallic inflammatory thing going on? I think it just begs the question and I really appreciate taking an interest because, I, you know, it's not of a practical value, but we've got to figure out these things, and, and we don't want to go headlong and throwing away all our aluminum pots and pans because that ain't going to get us anywhere, right? We've been through that. Don't do that. Okay. Have a good day. Yep.